Hello, yes, it is me, Jazza, your favourite politically engaged queer on the internet. And as you can tell from the questionable longer hairstyle and the bedroom office setup, we are in quarantine. As such, I was into my sixth straight hour of scrolling through YouTube when Instagram first trap and movie buff Jack Howard turned up on my feed listing the top ten movies for people to watch in lockdown. And I thought, I, I can do that. And I should probably, you know, do something other than just replay Final Fantasy VII Remake with my time in quarantine. And so, here we are. This is my idea being productive. But how can I put my own spin on this overtread genre of top 10 movies that you must watch videos? Jack and I are both quiffed men with adorable British accents. How can I make this my own? And then it hit me like a silver camper van driving through the Australian desert adorned with a glittering silver shoe. What sets me apart from Jack Howard? Well, homosexuality, of course. Now, the title says gay for clickbait and SEO purposes, but without further ado, here are 10 LGBTQ plus movies in hopefully something like 10 LGBTQ plus minutes. There are certain inalienable truths when it comes to queer cinema. Firstly, hands, gay. Secondly, water, also gay. Thirdly, and probably most importantly, of all of the modes of transport, bicycles are the most gay. There is also the trope of LGBTQ plus movies being pretty sad. Uh, the straights, they love to throw awards at sad queer people. Um, and we don't always want that, do we? We don't always want to be crying from sadness at the TV when there's like a global pandemic happening outside our windows. Um, and for those of you who don't want to experience that, there is Imagine Me and You. Imagine Me and You is a feel-good British late 90s, early noughties rom-com of the same ilk of kind of like Four Weddings and a Funeral or uh, Notting Hill or something along those lines. Uh, it is um, girl meets girl, lots of like flower symbolism. Um, and it has such a, it's just a happy ending. There's peaks and troughs, but the story it tells is just, it's kind of cookie cutter, but that's one of the reasons that I quite like it. If you haven't seen Paris is Burning, how dare you? I cannot believe you would turn up at a place like this and not have done your queer homework. Go away now and come back when you've actually done it, you little negligent so-and-so. Before there was Paris is Burning in 1990, a documentary that shows how queer people of colour and trans people in New York have gone on to inform modern queer culture to the extent where it's even like the stuff that we, how we talk to one another is is beautifully kind of the roots are shown in that documentary before there was that which showed the 80s the late 80s and 90s uh there was the queen which tells the story of a drag queen beauty pageant in the 60s uh, and the people who were taking part in that type of competition at the time and it is crazy to see again such a crystallized little time capsule of what it was like to be a queer person way back then there's unparalleled documentation of people who wanted to go out and fight for their country in the late 60s in the united states but were not able to they were turned away because they were too feminine and it documents the experience of of trans people at the time and gay men uh it is somewhat problematic sometimes because it is a documentary told in the late 60s about queer people, but it's still so valuable. But the reason that this film is so iconic is because of a singular monologue from one of the queens who are represented in the documentary, and that is Crystal LeBeja. You children will probably know Crystal LeBeja primarily as... Uh, the person who Arja, a queen from RuPaul's Drag Race, decided to impersonate on Snatch Game. Um, but Crystal LeBeja is an incredibly important queer uh, uh, person in um, LGBTQ plus history in the United States, not only for this iconic uh, speech where she says, oh, where is Sabrina? I will sue the bitch. It's 
amazing. Um, but also she is the founder of the House of Labasia, which is a um uh, a drag house that still exists to this day. The Queen is necessary homework. Please ensure that you do not skip it. Uh, and you can watch it on Netflix. I believe everywhere. Excellent. I am a white man on the internet, and so of course I have multiple podcasts because, frankly. My voice just needs to be heard. One such project is one that I share with my much smarter blue-haired angel of a friend, Rowan Ellis, called The Queer Movie Podcast. It is in fact very good, and you should listen to it. Off the back of the podcast, and in order to make quarantine a little bit more bearable, we have started The Queer Movie Club, where we sit down once a week on a Saturday evening and press play on a new LGBTQ plus movie every week. It's really quite nice. We talk about it on Twitter and Discord. It's just a lot of jolly good gay fun. We promote access to the Discord once a week on Twitter, so if you want to be part of that, then you should go over and follow the account. This week, we watched the new release from Netflix, the half of it. The director, Alice Wu, hasn't made a movie for 15 years since Saving Face, and quite frankly, how dare she? She is very good at her job, and we have been deprived of such wonderful cinematic storytelling for such a long time. She'd better have a really good excuse. Oh wait, her mother was ill and she was looking after her? I guess that's okay then. All offence attracted. Anyway, uh, the half of it is a very good movie we like. Wu dives in once again to telling a really touching story from a queer female Asian American perspective. Her protagonist, Ellie Chu, is used to taking commissions from her classmates who are failing, so she writes essays for them, but she turns her skills to the art of love letter writing. And she helps out the most adorable himbo in cinematic history. Oh god, his heart is so pure, but this boy is a dum-dum. The story essentially shows Ellie learning how to fall in love herself and see herself as somebody who could partake in love stories, which really is a mirror of what it's like to be from a minority where our stories of love haven't been represented nearly as much as our cis, het, uh, white uh, brethren. You can watch it, I believe, everywhere on Netflix because it's a Netflix movie. Very good, convenient for everybody with an account. Here's hoping we don't have to wait another 15 years for uh, what I want to be the sequel, which should be called, which has to be called, the other half of it. I don't make the rules, I'm just here enforcing them. The first film we ever reviewed on the Queer Movie Podcast was GBF, which came out in uh, 2014 um, and is directed by Darren Stein, written by George Northey and starring Michael J. Willett. Now, I had a very cool experience just last week where I was able to interview all three of them as part of the Peccadillo Pictures Sofa Club, which was very cool and not something you expect to do from your bedroom of a Tuesday evening, but there you go. You can still go over to the Peccadillo Pictures YouTube channel and watch that video. Very good. GBF itself is just a really lovely homage to the teen trash genre. You have so many iconic moments of kind of like the main characters turning around the corner in slow motion in the high school hallways. You have some really fantastic writing by George Northey. Like the best line um, comes from uh, the ridiculously named character Fawcett, who says, everybody can relax, the people who matter have arrived. It's just a funny, silly, joyful movie, uh, and you can watch it on, I think, Amazon Prime, Peculiar Little Pictures if you're in the UK, and you can rent it on iTunes too, I believe. Tangerine is a bloody masterpiece that I have definitely talked about on this channel before, and I can't help it because I am obsessed. Sean Baker is the director of the film, and he went on to make The Florida Project, which is probably the one that he is most known for, but a lot of those influences can be seen carried through those two movies, primarily just the wonderful use of colour. It's actually the reason that the movie is called Tangerine, um, because of the orange tangerine haze that Los Angeles gets in longer uh, kind of like evenings when the sun is setting and it has kind of like this this wonderful glow across the whole movie and what's more 
when they were producing the movie, when they were making the movie, they filmed the whole thing on iPhone 5Ss. And how dare they? How dare they? The movie itself focuses on two trans characters and is so fast, dynamic. It's full of violence and bitchiness and drama. And it all culminates and explodes and then ends with this tenderness that really represents the trans and the queer community quite beautifully. I think it's it's quite good at, at telling that story of that kind of like, we all bitch about one another, but there's a tenderness there to queer relationships. I like it. You can... You can find it on, on Prime for, I think, 99p, and you can rent it on YouTube as well for pretty cheap. So watch that. On the Queer Movie Podcast, we cover a different genre of cinema each episode. And one of the genres that we did was uh, queer sci-fi. And there aren't many representations of LGBTQ plus people in sci-fi, which is odd when you consider kind of like a lot of the overlaps of the experience of kind of being an outsider, the um, big... LGBTQ uh, following of um, uh, a lot of uh, sci-fi franchises, for example. Um, so imagine our joy when we discovered codependent lesbian space alien seek same. Yes, that is the full title of the movie. Codependent lesbian space alien seek same is a work of Madeleine Olneck, uh, who directed um, Wild Nights with Emily a couple of years ago. Um, and it's so, it's so weird. It's a, it's a very cool kind of like, similar to GBF, it's an homage to the genre. There's lots of kind of B-movie uh, uh, kind of callbacks in Codependent Lesbian Space Alien 6 Aim. But it's so weirdly funny. A lot of the... <laughs> A lot of the um, uh, choices in sound design are bad. A lot of this movie, uh, in terms of how it's made, isn't great. I just had a really great time watching it. <laughs> and I don't really know what else I can give you in terms of advice on this movie. Go in not wanting for it to be kind of like the Avengers Endgame. But go into it... Just buckle yourself in and go, wee, And then uh, eat a cheesecake at the end. The Miseducation of Cameron Post is probably the most mainstream, I'm going to say, of all of the uh, conversion therapy movies that have been made over the last few years. It's a lot more young adulty, John Green vibesy than some other more serious interpretations and representations of kind of like the story of people who have gone to conversion therapy in the States. The likes of uh, Boy Erased um, uh, uh, kind of like comes to front of mind as an example of one that takes it probably a little bit more, not seriously, but is certainly more hard hitting, more of a gut punch. The best part of this movie is the acting. And the characters and uh, how they're portrayed by the actors, uh, specifically Chloe Grace Moretz from um, who who plays the protagonist Cameron Post. But I think actually the strength comes from a lot of that supporting cast and uh, how even the antagonists we get windows into their own struggles as um, uh, queer people suppressed by uh, kind of like homophobic ideologies. But then. It's like the last five minutes just brought me joy. You can watch it on Netflix in most places, I think. Another recent release that is exclusive to Netflix, I believe, is uh, Circus of Books, which um, <laughs> the marketing of it um, leans really heavily into the fact that Alaska from RuPaul's Drag Race um, is an interviewee uh, as a former employee of the bookshop. Really, I'm so glad that I watched it with or without Alaster, because it's a really lovely family portrait, actually, I think more than anything, who happened to be surrounded by the LGBT community by running, uh, uh, by running a pawn shop, which is fascinating. The director, Rachel Mason, uh, really does a fantastic job here of telling a loving story about her parents and her family 
and it is so candid and moving in a way that I think is only really possible when you are so close to a story. She was, like, she's telling the story of her childhood um, that she wasn't even actually aware of. Her parents were uh, running a pawn shop and she didn't know until she was, like, in high school, I believe. Um, uh, it tells a story of um, kind of, like, people who ended up being great allies um, uh, her her parents, Rachel's parents, um, called Karen and Barry, and I cried loads. In a good way, cried loads in a good way. We don't get many queer voices in film coming out of Africa, um, which is only one of the reasons why I put Rafiki uh, on this list. It's set around the story of two Kenyan women uh, with the coolest hairstyles of anybody featured on this list, um, and they end up in kind of like. It's a star-crossed lovers, Romeo and Juliet style story, really. Wanuru Kahir is the director, um, and she uh, is uh, prolific, but hers is kind of a very interesting voice um, uh, uh, in what is often, like, I think uh, there isn't a huge amount of LGBT mainstream cinema, cinema anyway, um, and uh, the importance of being able to tell Stories from a different perspective that are kind of like um, uh, cis white men. Hello. Uh, it's really important. And it's a good movie. For, first and foremost, good movie. And finally, this wouldn't be a Jazza movie list without um, a pretentious foreign language movie. And I'm probably going to put the le one of the least pretentious foreign language LGBT movies that you can. And that's the way he looks. Everybody adores this film. We watched it as part of the Queer Movie Club a couple of weeks ago, and our hearts melted. It is a high school movie, technically, but is nothing like the stereotypical kind of American high school experience that you would see. It's set in Brazil. It is in Portuguese. The story that it tells of someone seeking their independence, of our protagonist, who is blind, seeking his independence from... Uh, his family, his expectations, but also that coupled with a desire that I remember having as a queer kid of wanting to run away. It portrays that desire for reinvention and desire for freedom in such a, oh, a really great way that that, that really kind of like, it, it touched me. Um, but actually, I don't want to spoil anything, but he ends up... Um, kind of finding that freedom and that independence without having without having to run away and that spoke to me as someone who felt like they wanted to do that a lot as a child we got deep so there are 10 gay movies in however many gay minutes it took great excellent do you have any suggestions down below check them out Go and follow the Queer Movie Podcast if you want to be part of our Discord Saturday night viewing sessions. Excellent, very good. That's all I have to say. If you want to subscribe, like, whatever, there's other movie-centric movie, movie -centric video there. Fine, do what you want. I don't own you. Bye, 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 bye.